Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day. But today's message isn't just for fathers, it's for all of us. We're talking about fear today. And some of you may have had the chance to hear some of this message on Thursday as I was privileged to share a time of Bible study and prayer over Zoom with our brothers and sisters in Christ at Glory to God Christian Church Eastern Campus. The title of our message today is The Result, The Results of Fear, with a subtitle of The Four D's of Fear. With the first Sunday of our in-person services coming up next week, since the shutdown, it would be understandable to assume that this message is in regards to coronavirus. Uh, but I have to tell you, I wasn't thinking about the virus in the slightest as the Lord gave me this message. But one thing that the virus has reminded me of is that we like to look down on the fears of others and excuse our own fears. But fear is fear. As a father, I can't stand to see my son afraid or moving in fear. I want to see him confident and peaceful and trusting, especially when I'm with him trusting that I'm going to take care of him. And our Heavenly Father is no different. He longs to see us free from fear. Second Timothy verse, or chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and self-control. And so Paul lists power and love and self-control as things that are opposite or that come into conflict with fear. So regardless of the fear you're struggling with today, whether it be over the coronavirus, whether it be over the collapse of the economy, those are the two sides and neither agree with another and everyone says, hey, you're fearful. Regardless of the fear that you're struggling with, I pray that this message ministers to all of us. Because all of us, at some level, deal with fear. Even right now, today, for me, as I'm preaching, I'm dealing with fear. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to fear not. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you do not just command us to not fear, but you give us reason to not fear. Because you are with us. And so Lord, I pray that as we learn about fear today, as we look at your scriptures, that you will work in our lives according to your will and your way, and that we won't fear your work in us, but that we will run to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, chapter 13 and 14. We won't read the whole thing. Uh, we won't read those entire two chapters, but I want you to open up your Bibles to those two chapters, chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Numbers. And we're going to start our reading at verse 10 of chapter 13. But just a bit of information before we start reading. Since Abraham, God has been promising his people that he would give them a land that he would give them a promised land. But since Abraham, from the very first time God tells Abraham that this is going to happen, I'm going to deliver you into a land flowing with milk and honey, God also tells them that this promised land will already be occupied. God fulfills his promise to Abraham by freeing his people from Egypt, by punishing Egypt, by defeating Egypt, by delivering the Israelites from the greatest military power in the world. 
And now, in Numbers 13, God is calling his people to see him fulfill his promise. And they stand on the brink of the promised land. But just as he had told them from the beginning, the land is not empty. So God commands Moses to send in spies. See what I have said, that it is true, that the land is flowing with milk and honey, and it's occupied. But it is yours. Beloved, why did God do this this way? Because God is seeking relationship with his people. He is continually asking, will you trust me? So let's dive into our passage, starting at verse 25 of verse 13. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, into the land which you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large, and besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negeb, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people, before Moses and said, let's go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. But then the man who had gone up with him said, we are not able to to come against the people. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And so they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw are great in height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and the congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we have died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let's... Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Zephaniah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread to us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Chapter 14, verse 39. Between those two, God tells Moses that he plans to wipe Israel out and start again with Moses. But Moses pleads with God to forgive them, and God does. But he punishes them with 40 years in the wilderness. Starting at verse 39. So when Moses told these words, to all the people of Israel, that they would be stranded in the wilderness for another 40 years, the people mourned greatly. 
And they rose early in the morning and went to the heights of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We will go up to the place that the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. But Moses said, Why now are you transgressing the command of the Lord, when that will not succeed? Do not go up, for the Lord is not among you, lest you be struck down by your enemies. For there, are, for there the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned back from following the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites came down and defeated them and pursued them, even to Horma. Amen. So again, what we will be looking at today is the results of fear. Faithless fear brings doubt. Faithless fear brings disobedience. Fear brings deflection. And fear brings defeat. So those four doubts, if you're writing notes, are doubt, or the four Ds are doubt, disobedience, deflection, and defeat. Let's look at the first one, doubt. Doubt is hearing or seeing something and questioning whether or not it's really true. Not, not, not all doubt is bad. Doubt can be a motivation to check the validity of something we hear. And often that is a very good thing. The problem is that we are notorious for applying doubt in the wrong places. Not applying it where we should and applying it where we shouldn't. Someone we like says or does something ridiculous and we have their back. We believe them. We excuse them. We defend them. When maybe we should be. Someone we don't like does good, speaks truth, and we doubt. When perhaps we shouldn't. Doubt is also affected by another D, deflection. We tend to doubt more often if the conclusions of the belief are something we don't want to deal with. At the promised land and even today, those we should be doubting and those we should be trusting are often opposite. They're often opposite of what we choose. We choose to trust those who confirm our fears and who confirm our desires. And we throw our lot in with those who look like us and act like us and think like us. But beloved, God does not look like us or act like us or think like us. And so far too often we trust man and we doubt God. We doubt God because fear makes us question. Fear makes us doubt the word of the one we should trust above all others. The evidence is right in front of us. We are in danger. Those living in the promised land are huge. They are powerful. They are defended. The giants in, their, in, in our lives are terrifying. The storm. The waves are crashing. The wind is raging. We are in danger, God. And you want, you want me to face that? We are often like Israel. No matter how many times we see God rescue us, no matter the cloud by day or the fire by night, no matter the miracles that fill our lives, no matter the assurance of God as he calls us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, no matter the assurance that he will go with us, like Israel, we see the battle before us and we stop. We stop right at the brink of the promised land. We see the wind and the waves and hear the call of the Lord. But our foot foot hovers over the water. 
hovers over the waves when our Lord is calling us to walk on them. And we don't take that step because we doubt. And when we doubt, very often we move into disobedience. Even if we say we trust God, even if we do not doubt, he, he says he will do, walking in that trust is a different thing. Fear is the enemy of faith, and without faith it is impossible to please God. When fear has control of us, disobedience is the result. God commanded the people of Israel to go into the promised land, but the fear of their foes caused them to rebel against God's commands and flat out refuse to do what they were commanded to do. They stand on the brink and they refuse to go in. They stand ringside facing the opponent that God has trained them to face. The opponent, opponent he promises to give them victory over. And instead, instead they decide they'd rather go back into captivity. When they were encouraged by Moses to obey, despite their fear, they decide to pick up stones and kill Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. Fear takes a hold of them, and fear sets them in direct opposition to God. We see the same today. We fear because we hold on to this world too tightly. We fear because we don't have power, people, Possessions, prestige, pride. We fear because we value our safety and our security. We love the idea of a God who is comfortable and secure and safe. But a God who leads into a promised land full of giants? We want the gentle lamb, not the lion of Judah. We want the God who will add to our lives not take our lives away from us. But the Lion of Judah is a lion. And some part of us knows deep down that if we truly surrender all of who we are to that Lion of Judah, that he will have his way in us. And his way will be different from our way. And that is frightening. But beloved, this lion, lion, as terrifying as he may be, this lion loves you. This lion, the lion of Judah, is for you. He wants to bring the best for you. He wants to, for you to dwell with him, for he is what it is. Let us no longer allow our fear to move us into or keep us in disobedience. Our third D is deflection. In youth group, I called this D the yabots. God's word says, do this. And we say, yeah, but. God's word says, or a spirit-filled brother or sister says, you've sinned. You don't have this right. Or you're wrong in this area. And we say, yeah, but. The word and the spirit say, change your thinking to match God's. And we say, yeah, but. The yeah buts are how we attempt to deflect responsibility for sin and attempt to deflect the commands of God. Attempt to deflect the guilt of disobedience. Attempt to deflect all that which is uncomfortable. The root of this is fear. Fear of the just punishment of God upon us. Fear of what we might have to lose. Fear of how we might have to change. It's been the same since the beginning. 
Did you doubt my word? Did you disobey my command? Yeah, but the woman you gave me, she made me eat it. Eve, the devil made me do it. Deflection. It comes when we are afraid to face the consequences. It comes when we fear what could go wrong if we actually were to obey the sometimes seemingly absurd commands of God. Love my enemies? Yeah, but they don't think like me or look like me but, or act like me. They're my enemies. Love them? Yeah, but that's impossible for me and I... I doubt even you can make that possible, God. So yeah, love my enemies? No. The people of Israel in this passage, instead of bearing up under the consequences of their sin, and from then on walking in obedience, again they tried to deflect that consequence and march into the promised land to do what they should have done in the first, time, first place, but this time they go out of disobedience. They don't like the consequences of their sin, and so they try to deflect it. This in our culture today, if you're on social media at all, you know that most, of a, most anybody of a different persuasion on any issue will refuse to listen to the other side. We dig in our heels and we refuse to budge. We refuse to listen. We refuse to consider the thoughts of people who don't think like us. Why? Fear. Because hear me on this. We need people who don't think like us. We need especially brothers and sisters in Christ who do, who do not think like us on all matters. And if we only entertain those thoughts which appeal to us, if we only accept the scriptures or the encouragement from fellow believers that echo our own, then we end up worshiping a God of our own design and not the true God. If we choose, as we so often do, to deflect criticism and correction, to deflect insight, to deflect the command and deflect the blame, Listen to me on this, beloved. What we are actually doing is deflecting not only the things we fear, but we are also deflecting the blessing of God. We are deflecting the relationship with the Most High. That is the best thing in life. What we were made for. Acts 7.51 says, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19-22 we read, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. And hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. The scripture is pleading with us, do not deflect. Don't ignore what the Holy Spirit brings. Don't refuse to receive the prophetic word applied to your life. Test it by the word. And if it's good, receive it. Receive it no matter how difficult it is. If any evil deed or thought or attitude is within you and it is brought under conviction, be ready to crucify it. Yes. If you are corrected, or criticize, face it without fear. Hold on to what's true, because God will use the painful correction to make you more like Jesus. Do not reflect and reject the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. We must hold on to self lightly and hold on to Jesus tightly. When Jesus calls us, follow me, he calls us to the cross. Our old life, our fleshly mind, our worldly attitudes, habits, traditions, and convictions must be crucified if we are to experience the power of the resurrection in those areas. 
Let us no longer deflect the resurrection by deflecting the cross. Fear moved the Israelites who had firsthand seen the wonders of God to doubt God's promise, power, and presence. Fear moved them to disobedience as they refused to go into the promised land. Fear moved them to disobey further and attempt to murder their leaders. Fear moved them to try and deflect the just punishment of God for their disobedience and go without God into the promised land to to try and deflect that punishment. And finally, fear brought them to utter defeat at the hands of their enemies. Fear keeps us from experiencing the victory that Jesus has already won for us. Fear keeps us from hearing, receiving, believing, and and the word of God. Fear keeps us focused on our own safety, on what we could lose. Fear Fear weakens us and robs us of our true identity in Jesus. Fear lies to us. It tells us we are weak. It tells us we are worthless. Fear keeps us from seeing that God is with us. Fear brings us defeat. When we think of David and Goliath, where was David's confidence? Was it in his arm? Was it in his sling? Was it in his own might? Of course not. David knew God, God alone would give him the victory. How did David know that? Because David knew God. When we function in fear, we will fail. Fear brings doubt, disobedience, deflection, and defeat. But our God does not desire those things for us. He desires victory for his people, and he has already won that victory for us. So how do we live in that victory? What is the cure for fear? God says it many times throughout the word. He says it to Israel in Deuteronomy 31. He says it to Isaiah in chapter 4. He says it over and over and over again through David in the Psalms, through Jesus in the Gospels, and through Paul in the Epistles. God is with his people. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for you are mine. In Romans 8, we read, if God is for us, who can be against us? Beloved, if you are in Christ, God is for you. Fear not. Obey his word, even when it's scary, especially when it's scary, especially when it's hard. For it is in those times when the giants are too big for you that God wants to remind you that the battle is not yours battle does not belong to you. Fear is all about loss. But in Christ, you already have the victory. Will we take it? That's the question. Will we take that victory? Or will we deflect it? God has brought us to the brink of the promised land. He has won the victory and we stand before the promise. But there are giants in the land. Giants of self, giants of pride, giants of the fear of loss, giants of the fear of defeat. We find ourselves still, if we find ourselves still standing on that threshold, it's time for us to go into the promised land as our God is calling us. Go with our God. For no giant, no giant can stand before God. Beloved, God is for you, and if God is for you, who can be against you? At the end of the 40 years, as Moses was dying, he encouraged Israel in Deuteronomy 31. He encouraged Joshua when they were about to go back into that promised land and face their giants. Moses said, be strong and courageous. 
Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. And he will not leave you or forsake you. Amen. Beloved, if you are struggling with fear, if fear is keeping you in causing you to doubt, causing you to deflect the blessings of God. If fear is defeating you time and again, the Lord holds the victory. He holds your victory in his hands. If you would but receive it. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have already won the victory for us. And Father, I pray that in every area of our life, as you are calling us to follow you, as you are calling us to be conformed to the image of Christ, as you are calling us to the cross, where we need to lay down every part of us that is not like you. Lord, we pray that you will give us your Holy Spirit to help us obey. Lord, we are in need of you. We cannot win this battle. We cannot face the fears within on our own. But Lord, remind us that the giants are not giants to you. The mountains are not mountains to you. And we can know the victory in every area of our lives when we walk in obedience with you. Have your will and your way in us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.